So welcome to this event. Uh, we're just beginning our third year of these public conversations. Um, this was prompted originally by the restrictions and some new questions raised by COVID. Our theme this year, centered in the storm, is focus on resting in Christ, not as an escape from the needs of the world, but as a necessary means to the transformative work of the church in the world. And we're reflecting over the course of this year on Jesus' invitation to us in Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Today's session, uh, Rest as Resistance, organized by our history and theology field, will explore how individuals and faith communities can find healthy rhythms of rest and resistance without falling into apathy on the one hand or burnout on the other. Um, to lead us in this, this discussion, we're grateful and honored to be joined by two outstanding guides, Dr. Amy Elizabeth Steele and Dr. Pablo Anabalon. Dr. Dave Bjorlin, our Assistant Professor of Worship, will be introducing our speakers um, at greater length in a moment and moderating their dialogue. Um, but before turning it over to Dave to get us started, I want to begin um, by inviting all of you to join in a shared practice um, that we as a seminary faculty and staff have adopted this academic year as we begin um, our faculty and staff meetings. Um, so this is a shared practice of centering. Um, that we'll begin this event with as well. Um, so I'll read the text from Matthew 11, uh, 28 to 30 in the uh, paraphrase from the message, and then invite us um, into one minute of silence um, to center ourselves, and um, I'll break that silence. Um, so I invite you um, to hear the text um, and, and sit in silence uh, before God. Are you tired? Worn out, burned out, come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Amen. So I'm excited um, to welcome both Dr. Amy Steele and Dr. Pablo Anabalon. Uh, but first, I wanted to say a couple words about uh, how we got to this place to talk about rest as resistance. I think many of us are experiencing, especially coming out of COVID, both that feeling of burnout, but also that feeling of not knowing how to get back into the world. It seems that in some ways, COVID and uh, being shut down showed us kind of, you know, in that apocalyptic sense of uncovering that maybe our rhythms weren't as good as they should have been or weren't as restful. And so one of the things we wanted to focus on as a seminary um, was how to actually model, you know, we'd often talk about the importance of Sabbath, uh, of rest, and then you would see the faculty kind of scurrying around to their next engagement. Um, and not living into what we're preaching. So uh, we decided to do rest as resistance, in part, uh, you know, using the works of people like Walter Brueggemann's Sabbath as resistance or Trish, uh, Trisha Hersey's The Nap Ministry. Um, so 
uh, we're so excited to have both Dr. Steele and Dr. Anna Ballone here. So um, first, Dr. Amy Steele, Reverend Amy Elizabeth Steele, is the Executive Director of Programs and the Dean of the Chapel of the Upper Room. She served as Assistant Dean for Student Affairs and Community Life at Vanderbilt Divinity School for more than a decade. Um, her scholarly interests are in 20th century Black religious thought with emphasis on the work of Howard Thurman, Black and womanist social ethics, spiritualities, homiletics, and aesthetics. She is a mother of one son, a college freshman, and is ordained by the National Baptist Convention USA. Welcome, Dr. Steele. And uh, Reverend Pablo Anabalon Saidi is an ordained minister in the Evangelical Covenant Church and is currently part of the pastoral team of the Iglesia del Pacto Evangelico in Eagle Rock, California. He is a licensed psychologist in the state of California and works in community mental health and serves as adjunct faculty at Fuller Theological Seminary and at Centro Hispano de Estudios uh, Teológico, CHET. He and his wife have a daughter and a son. So thank you so much for being here. Um, just to give a little uh, roadmap for our conversation, um, I will moderate a question and answer with Dr. Steele and Anna Ballon, um, and then we'll have about 15 minutes where they can discuss their ideas together. And then the last half hour will be set aside for question and answer from you. So we have the both the chat and the question and answer feature, I believe. So if you have any questions, simply write them there and we will take them at that time. So without any further ado, let's begin. So Dr. Steele, I'll let you begin this one and then Dr. Anna Malone after. Um, what in your cultural, social, and or personal traditions helped you think about work and rest and their relationship to resistance? Mm. Thank you, Dr. Orland. Um, and, and also thank you for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. It's, it's really exciting to, and I'm really hoping that it's a conversation. So it's exciting to be uh, talking about rest uh, as resistance uh, three years into a pandemic. So you alluded to that earlier. Um, so you're asking me what in my cultural sort of and bi biographical uh, background invited me to, to think about rest? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, that's a really good question because I come from really a background that um, didn't necessarily take rest seriously uh, <laughs> for a very long time. You know, I was from a, a family that, um, like many families, uh, particularly in the U.S., um, sort of fell under that Protestant work ethic. And so, you know, um, working and being a workaholic was really um, rewarded in my family. Uh, it's not until later years, really, where I've picked up on some scriptural references, one uh, that was read earlier, and then there's another one in Hebrews uh, that really, you know, caught my imagination a few years ago, and I've been hanging on to that. There is a, there is a sense um, both in the text and in some resources that I've come into contact with with Thurman that rest really is um, integral to um, being, that it's not necessarily something that we do as an aside, you know, although, you know, there are resources like the Nat Man Ministry that you mentioned that really sort of focuses on uh, rest and, and really the physical manifestation of rest in taking a nap or laying it down or relaxing or sort of just withdrawing as resistance to capitalism and, and um, and um, and you know, sort of that work again, and again, that Protestant work ethic. But you know, the resources that I have come into contact with, which I'll share a little bit more about, you know, throughout this conversation, is really about rest as a disposition. You know, rest as a way of moving throughout the world. Um, but again, that's that's not necessarily in my background. Um, <laughs> that's that's newer. Uh, to who I have, you know, sort of chosen to become, uh, uh, especially uh, as one who has been both in academia and um, in, in the ministry. Yeah, was there a turning point for you in that? Because you said it wasn't kind of in your uh, historical tradition or family tradition. 
Uh, that's a really great question. I'm and not sure if I can... It. And one I didn't prepare you for, I really... Right, no, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, it's it's okay. So I think that, um, it, you know, now that I'm reflecting on it a bit more, it really was the literature, you know, it was encountering the mystics um, who thought um, comprehensively about you know, sort of this idea of rest and stillness. And so, you know, we're talking, you know, maybe the turning point was graduate school. Um, so uh, early 2000s, where I'm thinking about, okay, you know, there's this concept of stillness and rest that I'm encountering in the, in the mystics that then got you know, again, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm rewriting my own, <laughs> my own history, but uh, it is, ma it is making sense to me that that would have been the time when I was focusing and really thinking about it more thoroughly um, in graduate school with the literature. Which is just a reminder that the academy can have real life impact on you. It's not just abstract. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's yeah. right. Uh, how about you, Pablo? Was, uh, was there any part of your cultural, social, personal traditions that started you thinking about this? Probably not. Sorry, that's a short answer for, for this. I come from a pastoral family for three generations. We have many pastors, so I completely resonate to what Dr. Amy is saying. My father, who was a pastor and bishop in Chile, uh, pride himself of not having a vacation in 30 years and said that publicly. Uh, I think he may have been exaggerating, but that's probably the, the public speech that we were exposed to. Um, I teach often in a conference in Chile. I was teaching one on rest and the Sabbath. And uh, right after the conference of a denomination which my family is connected, they interview us for a uh, short interview on TV local and we're talking about the topic rest and Sabbath and then my mother who's also a pastor said uh, he speaks wonderful about this he only needs to practice now what he <laughs> so, that has been a stiff learning curve for me and probably one of the uh, sovereign factors uh, for me was that my father died young on the ministry and I think uh, it, 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 it is a sovereign reminder that pay now pay later that if we are for the long run here, uh, we will rest uh, either way. So uh, it, I think that challenged my thinking and my practice uh, in terms of the need to that. Uh, you mentioned I pastor a part of the pastoral team in Eagle Rock. I think it's particularly challenging for many of my colleagues, pastores, pastoras, who for the most part are bivocational. So trying to uh, practice the Sabbath when you're bivocational, it, it gets a little bit more challenging in that sense, and you have to be intentional on doing that. I think um, some of the readings impacted my theology on saying that working uh, could become a false god, because I'm trusting that, and uh, Sabbath resting is honoring God and saying he's in control. So, so it's a strong theological statement and, and that has been part of what I try to do. I not always succeed, but that's part of what has informed my practice around that. Yeah, I think it's interesting that both of you, and I think many could relate to this, uh, are kind of grounded in a uh, an idea of ministry as work and kind of that badge of honor that you relate to work and ministries, which kind of leads to our next question in religious context. And I'll start with you, Pablo. Uh, I mean, you spoke a little bit about this with your father, but where have you witnessed unhealthy tensions between rest and resistance, too much of the other, or when they're pitted against each other? And where are some places maybe later in life where you've seen this lived out well? Yeah, so... I, I want to hope, and I think that the, the younger generations in ministry practice that very well. So we have uh, had a connection with Fuller and students in, from Fuller that have become part of the congregation for the time they're in uh, LA studying. And it seems to me that is refreshingly healthy. 
And I know they teach in North Park around this area. And my hope is that also impacts the students. Uh, the, I think there's a strong sense of boundaries and, and it is okay to say no uh, for time with the family. It's okay to say no for resting and to say publicly. I think part of my unhealthy models have been, uh, even if you rest, don't say too loud because you can be judged. <laughs> And, and you can, uh, there'll be some judgment around that. And even my own, I, I could become judgmental if I think that is not a good balance. So I, I'm hopeful to see younger generations to have a better sense on keeping that balance and uh, hopeful to see that played out in a, in a healthier way in that process. And um, for the most part, I have seen risk on being heavy on work and not so much on rest. I haven't experienced uh, people that are in the ministry that are too heavy on the other side mm. in, in, in that regard. Um, it hurts when you hear public speech criticizing immigrants coming to the US saying that they're not hard workers, they're here to benefit from the system uh, when I know not only people in ministry, but in general, how hard people work and uh, working two jobs to send the family and to do that. So uh, that uh, has been helpful on the dialogue, on the uh, conversations around this issue and, um, a, a, and a constant reminder of how also the need, which is probably unhealthy to keep an image that, that as an immigrant, I'm here to work, I'm here to make a contribution that also goes against the uh, embracing fully the Sabbath. Amy, how about, do you have uh, thoughts on that question as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've, um, I've seen um, the tension between rests and um, resistance more lived out in student activists. Um, you know, when I was at the university, we we would have, because of the timing, I think, you know, because of the historical um, time that we all shared together, um, I started my work at the Divinity School in 2011. And, you know, it was, you know, we sort of moved through um, several different social movements and, um, in our students, many of our students, uh, were attracted to the Divinity School, Vanderbilt Divinity School in the first place because of its legacy, its rich, you know, legacy and being prophetic and developing, you know, prophetic leaders. Um, but I remember having conversations um, serious conversations with a couple of students who were debating um, between taking um, a leave of absence and, and or, you know, reducing their workload because they found, um, they really found themselves being pulled um, in two separate direct, what felt like two separate directions being pulled, you know, to sort of be committed to the classroom and also you know, to be committed to the movements, you know, Occupy, this is first the Occupy movements. And then of course, with the, the very kill, um, shootings, police shootings of um, folks over the course of those many years, um, folks just found themselves, you know, like having to make really hard decisions about vocation, you know, who were they? Um, and these, these were questions that were really tied to their identity, not just to, the question of, you know, sort of should I rest or should I be involved, but real, real, um, the real depths of what it meant to be called um, in a ministerial vocation that while it may um, not have been sort of your, your, your traditional, um, what many of us would name as a traditional sort of ministerial vocation, pastoral vocation, they felt that call nonetheless to chaplaincy in the streets, to, you know, to movement leadership. So the quick answer is that I've felt that tension most um, in our student activists. Where I've seen it um, 
where I've seen it lived out well is a couple of places. Um, I probably should have alluded to this earlier, but you know, we were intention intentional um, as a um, theological institution, particularly in our field education department and writing into having students write into their contract, their field education contract, um, how they would tend to Sabbath, you know, how they would tend to this element of their of their vocational lives. And so, you know, that's a that's a real opportunity to um, for students to take that seriously to say, you know, that this is this is a, a component of um, the vocational life that um, absolutely is 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 as much a necessity as you know it's like as Dr. Pablo was talking about it's is as much of a necessity as you know showing up um for other people you know this was sort of an a way that the institution was saying back to students but you also need to show up for yourself so I've seen it lived out well there just in the contract it's the idea of the contract whether or not you know, <laughs> right. we live into it or not but um and then I think about you know, sort of our historical figures like a James Lawson and Anna Howard Thurman, folks who were real clear about their particular call. You know, so Howard Thurman, as as beautiful as he writes and as much of a necessity his work is to movement making was often, um, I'll say it this way, was often um, criticized for not being more vocal in movements, for not being more out front. But he was real clear about where his work lay. Um, and so, you know, I would suggest that I, that that's help. You know, that's really where um, I've seen this tension or, or seen this balance of rest and resistance lived out um, at its best, and that's in people like Thurman and people like James Lawson, who, you know, they knew that they knew their vocation was very specific. They didn't try to do it all, and they kind of, and you know, that to use this language, modern language of, they stayed in their lane. You know, <laughs> they stayed in their lane, and um, and and to our benefit because we have such great um, literature that they've created. Um, and we're able to sustain um, that now lives on for generations after them because they did just that. Yeah, as you're saying that. Oh, Sorry. yeah, Pablo. Yeah, thanks. Something that said Dr. Amy triggered, and I thought uh, around that balance and when it is that tension, if I may comment quickly on it, I think something that I've uh, noticed uh, working alongside with those very strongly embracing uh, social justice issue is a sense of being overwhelmed by the huge task and that challenging the rest and the Sabbath, that moving from one cause to another one. I've talked to many young people that, that feel pretty um, exhausted and powerless to confront what's going on. And, and I think that have taken away some of the joy and process, um, some of the possibility to keep that balance. I think that the sense of uh, mission and call is so strong that uh, it makes it a bit more challenging to, to embrace that. Uh, in the midst of a lot of stuff going on in, in LA, um, last 18 months, uh, a year ago, heard uh, President Obama's eulogy to John Lewis' funeral, and according to James, said, an American whose faith was tested again and again to produce a man of pure joy and unbreakable perseverance. And it, it helped us to use joy as a parameter on how those two were balanced on uh, fighting for justice, uh, but keeping that balance on terms of uh, embracing Sabbath. And as uh, joy was lacking, I think was a, a point to, to uh, self-reflect on where we were on that balance. Yeah, I, I love the idea of, I think it gets to both of your points, that idea that, you know, I, Flannery O'Connor says vocation implies limitation. And the, if you're called to something, it means you're not called to everything. Um, and so that really, Dr. Seal, when you said that, that, and I think, and that gets to your point too, Dr. Ana Ballon, that that joy can come when you know what you're called to. 
and thus what you're not called to, and knowing that we do this as a community, which might get to the kind of individualism that can be problematic too here. Um, Dr. Steele, you talked about Howard Thurman. So for some people who might not know who Howard Thurman is, could you give us, uh, who I believe you wrote your PhD on or a dissertation on, could you give us the kind of one minute elevator speech of, of who Thurman is for those who don't know? and then how he informed your understanding of rest and spiritual practices as part of the work of resistance. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the one minute uh, elevator version of, of who Howard Thurman is, um, he's a 20th century uh, mystic. He's a 20th century uh, black, you know, situated in the US male mystic, um, self-proclaimed, you know, he, uh, was one who, even as, an, as a child growing up in Daytona Beach, Florida, um, understood himself, sort of was raised with this knowledge that he had a second sight. Um, anyway, there's a whole story behind that, but um, from, from really from a very early age to uh, his death, he uh, not only sort of had these kinds of experiences that we might denote as mystic, mystical, but um, even vocationally, especially as a pastor, um, he served as uh, in various ways as pastor, um, as a professor, as dean of the chapel. Um, those were his primary vocations throughout his life, but um, even when he pastored out in San Francisco for about a decade, uh, he and his church really studied mysticism. Um, so he was leading, he was studying, um, he studied with Quaker mystic Rufus Jones, uh, but then after that went on to pastor and in his pastorate led studies with congregations. And, and they actually, um, congregations were very, you know, probably reluctant at first, like many of us are when someone says, okay, now we're going to meditate or we're going to sit in silence. But the congregations actually uh, learn to practice mysticism as well as study it, practice, uh, you know, practice meditation, I should say, practice meditation and also study mysticism. Um, and he was finally... Um, a, and I alluded to this earlier, but a uh, person, because he studied with Gandhi, was um, instrumental in shaping what became here in the U.S. a nonviolent civil rights movement. Um, there's a story about King, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., carrying a copy of Jesus and the Disinherited, one of Thurman's books. Uh, with him throughout the South, you know, throughout the civil rights movement or the rights for, or the, the movement for human rights. And so Thurman was a shaper of ideas and methodologies for the movement. That's the one minute version. <laughs> Maybe that wasn't a little bit more than one minute. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I think the second question is um, how, well, how did you word it? I don't want to, I want to get your wording again. I, how has uh, he and his work informed your understanding of rest as or spiritual practices as part of the work of resistance? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I've been yeah, thinking about this more and more in relationship to this conversation today and, um, and sort of went through and tried to pull some of those significant quotes. Um, and... It's really interesting, you know, so sort of when you call um, through Thurman's more than 20 books, you know, you're, you're not going to find long essays on rest. You're not even going to find long essays or, you know, um, paragraphs even on, you know, rest or stillness is something that he uses quite, quite a bit, you know, uh, the value of stillness. But I would say that um, in his work, um, he's really sort of shaping, massaging, if you will, this idea that rest, 
rest or stillness helps us to resist the tyrannies or regimes uh, that separate us from God and that threaten community. Um, and so, you know, if that's the thesis, you know, you really kind of see, you, you, you sort of see these ideas uh, being developed sort of on uh, an intrapersonal level, whereas, you know, he's making these suggestions about, in writing meditations about what it means to rest and, and how he experiences rest and even experienced it as a, as a young person. But then you really also get the sense, as I said a little bit earlier, that there is this development of an idea that we are also invited to rest in community so that rest is not just an indiv indiv individualistic concern, but it's a communal good, okay? And so um, I find that really helpful and, and really um, does impact the way that I think about rest too, because, you know, a lot of times we don't think about rest as being a part of liturgy, a part of our you know, sort of liturgical life together. But Thurman made it so. And um, and for him, you know, it was really the beginning or the seed or the core mysticism and this these ideas of rest and stillness, those were the core um, sort of what contributed the most to activism that we then move after we've been still and sort of... Um, allow God or the divine, the spirit of God or the divine to move in and through and around us that out of that deep listening, out of that deep sensibility of the presence of God in us and in humanity, we then begin to um, sort of understand the how the stripping away of those things that keep us from each other are important. So, it, you know, it's like the, for him, the mystic is an activist. The mystic is um, a uh, social justice leader, you know. Um, I'll stop there. Dr. David, if I, if I can uh, follow up on some of those thoughts, so, so rich, I mean, really appreciate it. Uh, even the idea of self-care, conveys a very individualistic approach to the way we do that. And I think we imply the excluding the community on that. So uh, how we, the language we use will, will uh, communicate who is involved in this process. So we have uh, elected to change exactly on the same way in terms of talking about self-care, talking about community care how we make accountable each other, how we support each other. Uh, for uh, all of us, the pandemic has been such a traumatic event. Uh, there's some studies uh, that said that for our generation, for the most traumatic event period on this time, and we still have to see the repercussion. The Organization of World Health said there have been increased of 25% of anxiety and depression uh, worldwide on this area. And I think uh, the impact on the education of our children and many other areas, it, it, it seems to me, and I don't want to victimize it or uh, be narcissistic, but the uh, impact on some of minority groups has been so big uh, when you consider there's uh, mostly in service work and also for immigrant churches that the church is not only the church, but the family where they're located for their cultures that have been practicing social distancing for centuries and uh, it's not the Latinx culture. So how do we, uh, th that's been challenging in terms of how do we continue to provide the community care in that context that have made it so challenging, but still want to make sure we are keeping each other accountable through that process in, in a context in which uh, we uh, don't, uh, we didn't bring uh, work to home, but home to work, and the boundaries are so blurred, how do we continue developing that community care that we owe to each other? 
Yeah, and I want to build on that, Dr. Anavalon, because um, I, I really appreciate how both of you are talking about the ne necessity of communal rest and not just kind of the individualized atomized self as the thing that we need rest, you know, uh, which again gets both to the rest piece and the resistance piece, right? Uh, both of those should be done in community too. Um, but specifically as a, a therapist, uh, and I know you work in the Latinx, Latino, Latina community, um, how has kind of your therapy work informed your understanding of this? I mean, you've talked a little bit about this already in, in what you see in the anxiety, and um, but has there been other ways that that kind of, when you put on the, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're not two separate therapist hat, pastor hat, but when you have more of the therapist hat on, does that change the way you view these issues or how you see them? Oh, you, it has been very significant uh, for the reason that, for the most part, uh, the job we do as a therapist has been assisting someone that's going through crisis or through some transition to challenges. What happened during the pandemic is that we're also going through that. Yeah. And that happened to ministry, right? Uh, and, and to everyone. Uh, we usually come from a calmer place when we... Uh, work with someone in therapy or in pastoral care. Now we are in the middle of the storm as the conference was, was titled. That remind me, uh, not only the passage we mentioned Jesus, but also Paul at the end of the book of Acts is going to Rome as a prisoner. Uh, this is a big storm and uh, hear a voice from God saying, do not be afraid and has a message for those on the uh, navigating with him uh, so it, it, the the challenge have been when you're in the middle of the storm how you do community get toward you but also provide that care for other ones um, the field of mental health like many other ones has been impacted we saw so many people leaving the field without a clear sense of a next job but just taking a break uh, I've been um, heavy on, on terms of burnt out through this process, uh, when we thought we passed the storm, then we have had waves of people rethinking their vocation. Uh, the same we have seen in teaching. I saw a number, which I think is wrong, that during the pandemic, over 200,000 teachers resigned their posts uh, on this two and a half year period in the US. I, I hope that's wrong. And I wanted to verify that. So I think all the helping professions uh, have been uh, acutely aware of the fact that we are providing support uh, where first responders when we're going through the crisis as well. Thank you, sorry, I was finding my unmute button uh, as we speak of things we've grown accustomed to during the pandemic, um, Zoom being one of them. Um, so I want to shift the conversation. I've loved this conversation. Uh, I keep these ideas of call and joy and resistance and vocation. Uh, but I, I want to kind of drill down now to some concrete practices. So for those who are trying to live into healthier rhythms of rest and resistance without falling into, I think, especially, you know, another election cycle is coming up. And it's so easy to fall either into this, like, I need to be doing X, Y, Z every day. I need to be doing something or that kind of apathy of nothing matters. Have you found some concrete practices in your own lives or in the lives of those you've read about that helps us avoid kind of these, uh, these two extremes of rest and resistance? And uh, Amy, I'll let you respond. Um, well, again, you know, so let me first say one thing about um, the split that we're making between rest and resistance. Um, on the one hand, um, I, I do understand the need to think of them as sort of separate entities, as separate ideas, as separate um, ways of, of uh, being, of doing. Um, and also, it's interesting to bring them together, that rest is resistance, that rest is an act of resistance. And so with that being said, um, there are some practices. You know, again, I'm going to go back to um, 
I'm going to make a note to myself so I don't forget something, but I'm going to go back to something that I said earlier about disposition. And that's really what sort of what I'm finding in Thurman, that rest is more of a disposition. I wanted to just, because someone asked about it in the chat, I wanted to bring um, this one uh phrase that Thurman will, will use, uh, and you, you'll find this in Meditations of the Heart, his book, you know, his little book on, which is a compilation of meditations. The way that he's talking about this idea of disposition um, is the hab habitual, this is a quote, the habitual use of quietness, the habitual use of quietness. And so um, that he then goes on to say that a person can carry, uh, carry around inside of them the habitual use of quietness that a person can carry around inside of them. Um, he talks about stillness of spirit and quiet invading us and becoming um, our total respiration um, where we are most acutely aware of the, um, of the, I guess this says of the presence of, this is something, but, but basically where we're, we're most acutely aware of the presence of God. And so I want to come back to the both of these ideas because we've been, I've been in circles now for the past three years, you know, since 2020, since we were remote, been in circles that really do focus on this sense of respiration as breathing, you know, like our total respiration, our total breathing, in fact, in God. And so I've been in circles where we've practiced deep breathing um, as a as a, a skill um, to deal with trauma. Um, the circles that I've been in have talked about how the breath, how, you know, the practice of deep breathing, and there's several kinds of practices related to this, but how um, it's scientifically proven that when we inhale and we exhale, sends messages to, you know, and I'm not, I'm not a medical, I'm not in the medical field, but the parasympathetic nerve, that um, basically is the nerve that's attached to the fight or flight um, instinct that each of us has. But it tells that nerve that you're okay, that I'm okay. And, you know, it, um, and with every inhale and with every exhale, you're sort of in, you're, you're sending this message to the body that, um, that it can settle, that it can relax, that it can still itself. And um, and that's been a practice, quite honestly, that I have employed and tried to in moments of stress. Um, and in I've also led some of these deep breathing practices with groups that I'm a part of. And I have been intrigued by how popular um, those have become. You know, the, the requests that I get to start meetings um, with a deep breathing exercise, just because we're so accustomed to, I think, to um, holding our breath um, or to have a staggered rhythm of breathing uh, because of the stress that we actually carry in our bodies, right? And so that's one, and I, I you know, I can stop there, but that's one real significant practice that, um, that I that I've practiced personally, and that I've seen um, real, a real hunger for in some of the communities that I'm that I'm active in. Uh, for me and uh, Dr. Derry, just to emphasize the two authors you mentioned, I think they do a great job when what Dr. Emmy is saying on how to see of those two together, Trisha Hersey and Walter Brueggemann talk about the, the, the Sabbath, the rest being that resistance. I think one of uh, a few things that have been helpful is a strong sense of boundaries and with that of the uh, limitations, like giving permission to the things I will not be able and, and will not do, uh, that, that phone calls that, that I couldn't answer or processing which I couldn't engage and and I've been intentional about that more so now than before um, maybe because of age maybe because of maturity I have a, a, a stronger sense of limitation and that has been helpful in both in ministry and in therapy 
a few years ago, we were going to a midwinter conference with a colleague uh, who got a call at 1 a.m. We we're flying on the red eye and we're in the airport at the time. And it's a church member who is telling the pastor that the uh, bathroom is not working. What should he do? And it, it hit me so strong. I'm saying, uh, I say the name, I won't repeat it now. How, how can you get a call at 1 a.m. because the bathroom of a person is, is not working? And I think that probably sounds exaggerated, but in some sense on, on ministry, uh, we, we want to fix everything. We want to be there for everybody. And I think that there's a sense that uh, we may disappoint some people, uh, that people that may not approve of some of that, and to be okay with that has been some of the practice that has been helpful to me to make some public commitments around Sabbath and rest and to have uh, people making you accountable has been helpful. Uh, during the pandemic, I developed a liking for gardening, which has been great for uh, centering and being present. Uh, I love, I love doing that. And uh, a prayer request, I planted recently some plumeria, so pray that they make it uh, uh, during this time and I appreciate that and that's been that been great, uh, great uh, engagement for uh, balancing those two. The boundaries discussion reminded me of a, the poet Jane Kenyon talks about the sacrament of saying no. And I've always loved that, uh, that there's something holy about also saying no to things. Um, so that brings us to the close of the initial part. And I was wondering, as we talked uh, Dr. Steele and Anna Ballon, did you did things resonate with what the other was saying, or do you have questions that you would like to ask of the other? I, I'm sure both Han and I could also ask some questions, but I thought it might be good to kind of cross pollinate our conversation a little. I have one one question for Dr. Emmy, which uh, would be interesting to um, hear that. For women making in academia, for women making in ministry, it seems to be unfortunately a higher bar, a higher demand, which I think a higher temptation to engage more in work and less in Sabbath. So I wonder, you as a woman in ministry, how have you navigated that? Wow, that's a great question. Um, not well. <laughs> Not well, but I'm getting better at it, you know, and something that you just said, Dr. Pablo, was really, you know, this idea of boundaries, you know, um, many of us have discovered since, uh, from, since working remotely, many of us working remotely have discovered that um, technology, that there's been this real sort of wave of good technology that forces people to um, tend to their habits, the good habits that they want to employ. And so I'm not a commercial for any of these apps that I'm going to name, but the, you know, there's some really good apps that have helped me take um, this idea of rest more seriously. I'm thinking about the Insight app that, um, I don't know if you know about Insight, um, it's, you know, it's an app like any other, but it's a, a meditation app and it gives you opportunity to set a timer. Um, you can listen to various kinds of meditations and the like. Um, it even has a teaching component, sort of a didactic component that you can tap into. Um, and so I've actually been using it to help me get to sleep. Um, I have also, I'm going to say this, um, I think not just as a woman, but as a Black woman, as a Black Southern woman, that um, is still um, really entrenched in a culture of respectability where work and commitment and showing up in places um, is a part of the culture. I've really made a, made a commitment to myself to nap more. Now, do I nap every day? No. Um, but I feel less shame around napping now uh, because I know that um, after a nap, my brain feels more rested and I'm actually more productive. Um, and I know that um, as a human being, you know, that again, rest is a necessity, it's not a luxury. So it's complicated. 
um, Pablo, it's, it's really complicated to have um, a culture of norms that are unhealthy, you know, sort of for, you know, putting pressure on you to live uh, differently from how the body really um, wants and needs to respond. You know, we need rest and sometimes the norms around us do not, um, you know, they don't honor that. They, they, they don't really um, have patience for it. So um, it's just really learning how to take it more seriously, to take rest more seriously. Yeah. Um, and with that, let me ask you a question because I did want you to talk more about for those who are learning boundaries, what what have been real, what have been the most helpful resources for you in um developing good boundaries in, in learning how to say no uh and the like. Thank you. Thank you. I think that question's for you, Dr. Anna Ballone. Like, where have those boundaries been helpful or how have you developed those boundaries? And we skipped Max Lee's question, which is, I think, oh, primarily, but I'll, I'll answer this one and then we can go back to that. Yep. Great, great question. Uh, and again, I appreciate that question. For me, I, I think we will probably start with the discerning on what, what, how we establish the boundaries. For me, has been a lot of reflection on why would I say yes? Why would I say yes to any particular request, engagement, uh, and and sort of trying to be honest? Take hey, is it is it because uh, I think I can make a contribution? Is it because people would think? wrong of me if I say no. So for me, the first point has been, why would I say yes? And that will inform the possibility of uh, saying no into that uh, process. Uh, sometimes I've been in consultation when, when I'm not in doubt, and those are, those are bigger engagements, right? Uh, it's not a day to day, but for bigger engagements, I seek feedback uh, when I'm invited to do something and uh, discuss it on that area. So th those are the two things that help me to inform the notes that I say. Thank you both so much. Um, we'll move into some general questions um, and responses. We have a few and we are collecting those. So uh, please feel free to post any questions you have in the chat um, and Dave and I will bring them to our guests. Um, so the first question comes from Max Lee and he asks, Drawing on mysticism where we find rest, where we find rest by entering into God's presence through the reading of scripture, prayer, and other spiritual practices, can we talk about a communal mystic experience? If God is present in the community in a way not with the individual, what kind of communal practices can we engage that draw us to rest in God's presence? Um, I'll go ahead and start with that because I think this is a reference to something that I said earlier. Um, so I'm going to, Max, this is a great question, and um, I'll encourage you, if you're, if you're interested in learning more about um, communal practices uh, around stillness and rest, um, Howard Thurman has a book about his experience pastoring in San Francisco at the Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples. Um, the name of that book is Footprints of a Dream. And um, and I actually happened to pull a quote I, I, uh, that I wanted to share today um, because I think it is really interesting, this idea of communal practices, you know, engaging in communal practices of rest. And so if you'll perm permit me, I'm just going to read this quote. Um, it's from page 70. Maybe you already have the book. It's from page 70. And... Um, I'm just going to read the quote. It says, congregational stillness and rest, uh, or the title, uh, um, I'm sorry, it's not the title. That, that was my note. Sorry. <laughs> it's about congregational stillness and rest. But anyway, the, the quote is, here the congregation and the minister become still in the presence of God. Basically, um, this quote is um, 
It is um, a depiction of a practice that the church did um, regularly in Sunday morning worship. They had about 30 minutes of quiet before the worship time. And so he's describing, he says, here the congregation and the minister become still in the presence of God. This is the time when the innermost um, secrets of life are laid bare without pretense. When each of us feels that we are in the presence of the one who understands uh, thoroughly and completely and whose presence it is unnecessary to pretend anything out of the period or out of out of the period of meditation, there comes a high resolve and a sense of being cleansed. So again, what he's describing is this practice that he introduced to the congregation. Basically, it was a practice, again, where they were quiet for 30 minutes, um, intentional quiet, right? They knew that this was a meditative period. Um, it was bookended by some words at the beginning, some music at the end, but they practiced that. And eventually, um, Thurman will go on to say that for those who, you know, were new to the practice or were finding it hard to to be still, to use that practice in the way that it was intended, he would write something, you know, so something like a prompt um, that people could use um, in the quiet if, you know, if the quiet itself um, wasn't particularly helpful. You know, it, it's almost, um, he talks about this meditation, this meditational practice as something that you really did have to develop. It wasn't something that comes natural. And um, and writes about having this prompt uh, for folks who found it difficult. So that's one way. I think that that's one, um, and I lost your, your quote there. Oh, let's oh, see. Um, yeah, you know, um, I think the other curious thing about that practice in particular of um, the use of silence within worship um, is that it really speaks to a bigger question that Thurman had um, in engaging this practice with the congregation. And that question was, um, are there really no differences? He's really thinking about this passage in, I think it's in one of the letters that Paul writes that there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, you know, but all are one, da, 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 in Christ Jesus. Thurman's question is, is that true? You know, and can we really experience that? And, and how can we experience it? So the, the question really leads him to explore different practices that make that sense of unity and oneness possible. And he found it in the, in the experience of quiet in the experience of stillness. So that's one. Well, one comment I'll add to that is that the challenge is not only to uh, rest as a community, but to do many other things as a community. I think we have uh, failed on reading the scripture as a community. So I think one practice will reinforce the other one. And I appreciate so much what you're saying, Dr. Amy, so explicitly about rest in community. And I think what, how we continue embracing all the other ways that we're in community. Uh, the, the Common Church published a, a paper on uh, scripture, reading scripture, and it emphasized so much. I think it was the influence of uh, North Park Professor Klein Nodras, the fact that God reduced to us as, as a community. And I, I think the different practices that we engage as community that goes against the individualism, I think will continue impacting also the way we rest as community. Well, I'll jump to Megan Fowler's question. And she asks, are there any particular discernment practices you advocate for discerning what boundaries to put in place? Certainly natural limits, health, et cetera, play into this. But I have a hard time knowing what boundaries are quote unquote selfish, self-indulgent, and what are godly and right. We live in a self-care me first culture simultaneously with an addiction to work, a very confusing place to do this sort of discerning. So do either of you have thoughts on that? Uh, 
Yeah, I, I alluded briefly to that before, thinking about addressing that question, but, but I'll say examining the motivation, examining the motivation to what I say yes, to what I say no. Uh, the, the call we all have is influenced by God's image, but also by sin. The, the motivations we have uh, are mixed, so how we continue um, examining that and uh, sometimes what it seems a uh, selfless act of service to community, a selfish act of self-congratulation. So I, I, I think examining the motivation for me has been big uh, to when I say yes and when I say no. Yeah, I, I love that. In fact, um, Pablo, I love the idea. I think you said this earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why would I say yes? I've never really taken, you know, approached discernment um, around that particular question. Why would I say yes? Uh, so that's really helpful. I wanted to offer one other thing, um, one other perhaps tool of discernment, again, from Thurman. And um, this is out of one of his, another one of his meditations, but this is again related more to not necessarily a process of discernment, but a just a disposition. Maybe it's a disposition of discernment that he writes about being being cool and still in the mind, being cool and still in the mind. Um, for me, what that what that reminds me of is this um is the deliberateness of dis discernment. You know, a lot of times we feel the push to make quick decisions and, you know, hurry up and respond to requests that are made of us. But, you know, if we can sort of allow um, ourselves to pause um, and actually take time for discernment, um, a lot of times that does help. I, I've, I, in my own practice, um, I used to, to say yes much too quickly, you know, out of all kinds of reasons. You know, if a friend asked me, yes. If, you know, if it's something that I really enjoy, yes. <laughs> you know, instead of, you know, allowing some space to um, lapse between the request or the invitation and my response. And um, and part of that, allowing that space to lapse or time to lapse, for me, has to do with this idea that Thurman has of being cool and still in the mind and being reminded that I don't have to respond quickly um, and I don't have to say yes, you know, that, that, I, that I can actually be invited to do something that sounds really fantastic that um, that I turn down, that I say no to, for for any number of good reasons. Um, but yeah, I love the question, Megan, and appreciate it. <laughs> We're looking at each other. Um, so I I have a question, um, and want to invite others to add their questions to the chat. Um, any and all questions, um, and this is a little. This is similar to what Megan raised, but I think most much of our conversation has focused on the hazards of resistance or activism um, without sufficient um, spiritual practices, grounding, rest. Um, but in terms of the opposite extreme, um, the risk of I think of like the origins of the self emphasis on self care coming out of um, strong activist movements, but apart from that, if you just have rest as a kind of self indulgence, um, you know, Dr. Pablo, you mentioned motivations as one tool for discerning, saying no, when to say no in a way that is um, like appropriate versus just apathy or laziness. But I'm wondering if there's also some, if I, either or both of you could. Um, flesh out a little bit what you see as like the fruits of a rest that is um, fragmented from community or um, an appropriate work in an appropriate vocational sense. Um, you know, you mentioned Dr. Pablo Joy as a marker of 
a resistance that is grounded, what might be some of the markers um, or fruits of like a, an isolated or self-indulgent rest? That that is a that's a great question. <clears throat> I'd love to hear the answer. I'll, I'll give it a shot and uh, love to hear from Dr. Amy on that. Mm -hmm. I think a rest that is according to God's plan, it renews. So how rested you are after that? And uh, sorry for for being so obvious, but but a rest that is not restful. Uh, there's there's sleeping that is not restful. That that activities that are not uh, renewing the energy. So I think that could be a way to measure that. If it is not, if you feel the same after that, if, if it is not renewing, if it is not energizing, I think it would be a good call to review uh, how you're engaging in the practice, to review how that process is uh, going. I think uh, at the risk of contradicting some of the uh, opposing rest with work, uh, rest could be productive and could be fruitful. Uh, there's a Latin expression of ars osium, that the, the result of what we do uh, while we're resting. So uh, again, at the risk of, of, of sounding workaholic, but, but there is something that is generated on the rest, uh, some, some thoughts, some ideas, some, some on that. I think that would be also be a good parameter to say, is this a healthy or an unhealthy uh, rest in, in that process? Uh, some of the practices we engage uh, could be uh, more of OCD than uh, engage a health engagement on some of, of uh, what we're doing through that. So uh, I'll say how we change some of the rhythms on our rest to see we are not attached to some specific practice thing we do but it's, it's a more freeing or liberating experience. Those three things are a common on that. Yeah, I, I love this idea of renewal, you know, that rest is, re, is renewing. Um, I think the fruits of my own, of, of the fruits of good rest as I've experienced it um, is, you know, my posture changes, my breathing, you know, my, my capacity to be present with other people um, is heightened. Um, those are sort of the tangible material fruits of, of good rest as, as I've experienced it. Um, good rest uh, puts me in a position um, really to be present in a way that I'm, I'm not present when I haven't rested well or maybe even when I've overindulged it's been like I don't even know what that means <laughs> I'm looking for the, the answer to that question too I'm, I'm not quite sure that I've had the experience of an overindulgence um or an isolated rest um but I imagine that that too is problematic and, and I imagine that the most problematic piece of overindulgence or sort of what you're saying, um, Dr. Hanna, in a in a isolated rest, which I really would love to hear a little bit more about what you mean by isolated rest, um, is a rest that does, you know, and I'm going to use language of the soul. I know that that's a, you know, it's that's a um, really nuanced concept. But um, but rest that, um, to use your words, rest, rest that's isolated or self-indulgent doesn't put the soul, you know, the soul isn't, isn't um, hasn't renewed. Use your word again, Pablo. Um, that the soul, it, that there's a problematic, um, contradictory, um, and perhaps confusing um, element of the soul that the soul hasn't given, ha hasn't gotten a chance to renew um, or to be restored. But that's a great question. I don't know. Say more about what you mean by isolated rest. When I was, um, I'm sure I didn't 
say this very well, but I was thinking of isolation more in the categories that we were discussing of individual versus communal. Like, you know, there's a place for coming apart from people, but there can be a rest that is more a rejection of, of community or, you know, a, in a negative sense, an escape. That's what I had in mind by isolation. That reminds me of a Von Hofer quote that says the church is a community in which those who like to be isolated are invited to be in community and those who cannot be alone are invited to be alone. So that, that dance between those two. Yeah, I was thinking about the difference between, you know, I've had the Sabbath practice where I, you know, after church, put on Netflix and just kind of zone out for three, four hours, right? And you don't, at least for me, that doesn't make me feel better, or maybe that's the renewal language, right? Uh, it's more of a shutting off or shutting down rather than a renewal. Uh, and that's been my experience of like those those times, the difference between rest, kind of an isolated rest where it feels more like I'm running into a cave or something versus uh, some type of rest that includes connection with God, creation, other people. Um, I am curious. Quick yeah, comment on that one. I think that that's super, super good comment. And I, I appreciate that. The, the only thing that I'll add to that is uh, I've heard Jan Gorman, who was the active uh, acting superintendent of Pacific Southwest Conference, alluding to giving some permission on saying we all have some relational capacity and relational yes. energy. And especially for ministers at the end of a service, you are depleted of that and you do need to be alone and you need to do things for yourself uh, to, to, in order to replenish some of that. So, so that also may be some permission for that. You will never hear me uh, resist being alone. So amen to that. I, one of the things I was drawn to, um, Dr. Steele, when you were talking, is this idea of the connection between the necessity of stillness, like vocation and stillness seem to have to go together in some way. Um, I was thinking of like vocation being like li literally to call, you know, from the Latin uh, and listening. So I'm just wondering if you have any more thoughts on what are the connections between listening stillness, listening, vocation, and this conversation of rest, or, or maybe discernment might be even a better. Um, yeah. So uh, you're asking about the connections between them. Um, my mind is racing in a couple of different directions. Um, yeah, I do think that the connection, if there's an equation, you know, part of the part of the equation that I would put together in my mind is that, you know, th that um, that stillness um, plus stillness plus discernment equals vocation. You know, if there's a mathematical equation behind it. Uh, a lot of us hear that call out of a place of um, if not rest, a place of stillness um, where we struggle with, you know, with call um, and maybe even resisted it to some extent. Um, I have visited here recently, have an opportunity to visit um, a few, couple of monasteries and so I've been thinking a lot about, for instance, the last one that I visited was, um, uh, what was it, St. Oh, I think it was St. Monrad. Is that where Thomas Merton was? Um, I'm sort of getting them confused. I can't remember exactly, but anyway, it was the monastery where Thomas Merton um, spent a great bit of his life. Um, and so when you think about Gethsemane, thank you, thank you, Gethsemane. Um, and so when you think about, you know, life and community there, um, and then the very last sort of part of his life, um, he withdrew even from that community and um, headed, built a little cabin that's now 
sort of memorialized, but build, build a cabin a little bit further away from the monastery, you know, it just makes you wonder about really the need for this balance, you know, even in, even if, when we think about monastery, even in a community sort of withdrawn, intentionally withdrawn from um, what many of us understand as, you know, the very kinds of communities that we are in and a part of operate in, um, to think about what stillness looks like there and the role that it plays and then the balance between, again, all these things that we're trying to bring in conversation with each other. I don't have real, really a full thought thought out there, but I just wanted to raise that as another sort of example or another model, if you will, another aspect of this conversation that there are people for whom, you know, this idea of stillness is built into the hours. You know, you think about the um, the prayer, the hours of prayer, they're getting up at three o'clock, they're praying again, 3 a.m. and getting and praying again at six and sort of, you know, praying the hours and um, just thinking about the rhythms. And so, um, not that I'm trying to tie this up nicely, and I don't think I could, but, you know, again, it's really kind of this balance that, um, A, it's the balance, but it's also, for me, it's wondering whether or not these two pieces, rest and resistance, can be the disposition through which I live. Can that be how I move and, and what really grounds and centers um, how I choose to be in the world? So uh, that's a lot of things that are unrelated to each other. <laughs> that, that's very rich and, and a lot of thoughts and, and very thought-provoking, Dr. Amy. I appreciate that. The only thing that I'll add to that is how we think of vocation as a process more than an event that happened in different seasons of our life. We're called a different place to different opportunities to different communities and how the risk of making some of those decisions out of being depleted mm -hmm. uh, may lead to, to wrong uh, decisions on, on what we think are vocation. So the, the, how we strengthen the likelihood of hearing God uh, from a place of uh, rest rather than uh, depletion. And that's uh, something for, for me to put mind always. Yeah, I love that idea. I love the, the equation was really helpful for me. And I, and it feels like it keeps cycling back, you know, it's like a, I don't know, like a closed system or something. Cause it's like, you get to that vocation and then that it helps you do that. Like, it reminds me of Pablo, what you said about why should I say yes? And then you can say, well, here's my vocation. Does it fit in here? But then you also have to be continuing that stillness and rest piece. Um, uh, last, last comment, uh, which is just a thought I have with all the conversation we've had. I grew up in a Pentecostal background and sometimes I need to lay hands on myself and cast out the spirit of multitasking. <laughs> that has been that's been an awful practice that doesn't help me on, on what we're talking. So let's do that. Um, I'm going to bring next um, Susan's question, and depending on our time, we'll come back um, to Max's follow up question. But she asks, um, I appreciate everything said so far, but I'm still stuck on how to apply this at home, especially if our uh, spouses or partners don't understand our need for rest, which might be different than theirs. Um, I recognize some people won't like our nose, um, but if it results in fights, the extra rest doesn't seem like it might be um, worth the flights. So any, any tips on how to do this at home, especially if there's some who aren't um, you know, as, on the same page or as appreciative? I, that's a great question, a great comment. Uh, we usually, for assessment for chip planters, use uh, Mason Briggs assessment, and it is clear on conversation with some of the couple that even the definition of what rest means may vary from person to person. That if I think on a vacation, some will say something spontaneous, we'll figure it out, and someone is very planned, very structured. We'll say we have a free Saturday, what a great opportunity to invite friends and spend it together. 
and the other one will say, what a great opportunity to be alone and, and be rested. So the more explicit those conversations and the couple, uh, I, I think the better likelihood to navigate that, the more clear is that the difference we have and how we uh, support each other in that process, even if that's different to our needs. I, I truly hear you on, on saying that if it, if it negotiating for rest, maybe more work than not getting it, then, then that, that's, a, that's a hard equation to, to sustain, to maintain. So how explicit those conversations, how legitimate uh, we acknowledge the difference are and how we support each other in that process, I think will be part of the challenge. Um, there's another question um, from Gaius Berg saying, what would you say to those like children who might see rest as punishment and to older or retired people who feel like they're given too much rest and feel they've been put on the shelf? Uh, well, I'm going to go back to a word that um, Dr. Pablo used, which was negotiation. You know, um, I think we're, life and community is, ne is a negotiation. And even for children, you know, I think that I have a, for instance, you know, practically speaking, I have a son who's extremely extroverted, you know, just never meets a stranger, is always, you know, willing to have conversation and play and just be engaged. Uh, his mother, <laughs> however, is a little bit, you know, more uh, needing of rest and stillness and, and more introverted. So it's, you know, it's negotiating and really with him, question about children, um, it's going to just, it's going to look, rest for him looks different. Um, it, it looks different. And a lot of times rest for him looks like um, playing um, one of his games, you know, the, the, the video games, um, or it looks like, you know, having his phone. Um, so I've learned to really listen to that and understand that his need for rest looks different from my need for rest. Um, I empathize with both children and, and elders. I think this is a great question because um, you heard, I heard it a lot coming out of um, the first part of the pandemic that folks who lived alone really were experiencing um, a sense of isolation where rest really felt very isolating and, and, you know, they experienced levels of loneliness that they hadn't really felt ever, you know. Um, and so, again, I think that the key word here is negotiation, trying to figure out what does rest mean for each of us? What does it look like? And how might we live into that more deeply? You know, we do have scripture, but scripture doesn't give us uh, the how-to. You know, we know that uh, there's this, you know, the, the, the scripture around God resting and uh, taking Sabbath rest. We don't know, you know, the specifics around what that might have been, what that looked like, what, was, what were the characteristics of that rest. Um, and, and I dare say that most people here, you know, that, that are gathered even um, on this Zoom, we all have different definitions of what rest, um, you know, if we say, all right, the next hour, we're all going to be committed to rest after this session. Um, some of us, you know, we're going to, we're, we're going to all be doing different things. So um, this constant negotiation um, for ourselves and for ourselves in community, I think is really important. Make a, a quick comment on the older adult one. I, I think we owe the population a better job than what we have done. I so much appreciate Crescendo's work within our denomination on helping us to reflect about the population and how it's engaged in, in church. More than what I've wanted to have conversation with church members, I said, I want to die because I have nothing to contribute. And I think the, fa the church has failed. Any church member, I think, uh, he or she doesn't have anything to contribute because then that's absolutely contrary to the idea of the body of Christ. But we have not been creative or been too thoughtful on seeing how we engage. Uh, of course, rest, of course, different pace, but of course, on the, on the meaningful contribution they can make to the body of Christ. 
Um, we'll go to the last question because it fits in, uh, Amy, with what you were talking about. And it's Max Lee, uh, who talks about, you know, many people identify themselves as introverts and find, as you said, strength in or withdrawal from people in busyness. And so the idea of uh, communal rest may be, for lack of a better word, stressful or intimidating. Uh, any words of encouragement and exhortation to share with those who might be reticent to find rest through the community and are drawn maybe more exclusively to those individualistic mystical practices? Uh, well, you know, there's both, you know, both are evident in Thurman. I'll say that, you know, both of those practices are, are evident. And, um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm going to, um, suggest that the balance is important. Um, I guess it's the why that we might be after. Why, why the communal, you know, why the communal practices of rest? Um, that's, that's a, that might be a master thesis, you know, <laughs> that might be an opportunity for us to, to think a little bit more deeply about just the practice of being in community, period. You know, why the practice of community? Um, and what is the practice of, you know, what is that really mean? You know, how do you practice being in community with, with one another? Um, Max, that's a good question. Uh, I don't have a singular answer, but I will just say that there is some importance for me um, in having both, having, you know, sort of both the individual experiences of rest and being called in a, into community. You know, what does it mean for the church at large, the church universal, if you will, to be at rest together. What is that? What are the deep theological meanings behind that? I, I absolutely agree, Dr. Amy, that it's not an either or, and that as we learn new practices on Sabbath and rest, it doesn't necessarily automatic means we'll be comfortable. Like any new skill we learn, there's some degree of not being comfortable that might be necessary for the learning experience. Well, that feels like a good place to um, wrap up. So first and foremost, we want to thank you both, uh, Dr. Amy Steele and Dr. Pablo Anabalon, uh, for your wisdom um, and for uh, the gift of your time, because we know that you uh, had to discern to say yes to this. And so we're glad that it was something we're saying yes to, hopefully. Um, we'd also like to thank Luke Palmerly, who's our Director of Operations at the Seminary, for his admin and Zoom management support, uh, the Lilly Endowment for their financial support, the Church is One Foundation, as we say, uh, uh, for their support of this series. And we this is, this is part of a series where we do public theology lectures here at the seminary, and our next one is on February 8th at the same time, 12 central time, and it's Finding Rest in God, Therapeutic and Ministry Insights, and that one will be sponsored by our ministry field. Um, so I will close in prayer. So let's go to God in prayer. God in whom we find our truest calling and our deepest rest. May you call us even now to that stillness, to that place of rest, to the still waters where you lead us. May you teach us to discern where your voice is calling us to. May you give us wisdom to know when to say no, what boundaries to set up. And may you give us joy in the work we do, that in all we do we may have that restful disposition, that still and cool mind, that we may make decisions not based on our own ego, not on the needs of others, um, but on the call you've placed on our life, because we know that the one who has called us is faithful and will complete that work. And so we ask this all in Christ's name, and we ask that your spirit would guide us as we leave this place in Christ's name.